Chapter 4 Arrival Shaking her head while cooking them lunch, Mary laughed at Kevin pacing around their house, waiting for his package to arrive. You know it's not going to be delivered until you do something else, Mary said, laughing as Kevin looked out their front window yet again. Kevin knew he was being a little obsessive, but ever since he had won the old rusted sword, anticipation of its arrival had grown by the minute. He hadn't felt this excited about a package since his first replica sword as a child. Turning his attention to his wife, he playfully snapped back with, You just cook and let a man do man things. Oh, really? Well, does the man have everything he needs for cooking dinner tonight? Or is the man going to do man things and forget to check first? Mary snapped back. Just hurry up with my lunch, woman. I'll hurry up and smack you upside the head with this skillet. Now come and eat. It's ready. Mary loved to play their little word games and saw it as something that kept things playful. Doing as she ordered, Kevin sat down beside her and had lunch. Having lunch together was rare due to their schedules. Even though Kevin's shop was only a few hundred feet from their home, Mary was gone three days a week, working at the hospital, and spent many of the others studying. This was a pleasant time to catch up and make plans for the week that would constantly change. Once they finished, Kevin gathered up their plates to rinse and load into the washer. As he did so, he watched Mary walk off into the other room. Where are you going? Kevin asked. You don't worry about what I am doing, you just keep doing man stuff, she replied, while walking away snickering. As he rinsed the last dish, Kevin spotted the delivery truck through the kitchen window as it turned into their driveway. He quickly placed the plate in the washer before running out to meet the driver. Kevin still couldn't believe he was getting so excited about an old sword that could have multiple cracks hiding under the rust. Nevertheless, it was here, and anticipation of restoring it grew. Stepping out of the truck, the driver held a long, narrow box. Kevin? he asked. Yes, Kevin responded, before taking the package from the driver. With the package now in his hands, Kevin turned and hurried back inside. Having studied the package on his way, he could see it was sealed well and required a knife to cut. Without delay, he walked over and grabbed a dirty steak knife from the sink and began opening the box. Inside, he found newspaper packing with Japanese writing. He pulled it free to reveal the dark tang of his new rusted sword. Kevin yanked the sword from the rest of packaging, revealing a long, rusted piece of metal. To him, uh, it was magnificent. He held it by the handle area and gave it a smack along its side. The force caused the sword to flex and vibrate in an attempt to discover any fatal cracks hiding within. Pleased that it didn't just snap into two pieces, Kevin then pinched it between two fingers and ran them back and forth, investigating the thickness of the rust. One area drew his attention that seemed to have engraving, but was raised slightly, not indented. He spit on the area, then used his thumb to rub it, only to feel an all-too-familiar sting. Pulling his thumb away from the blade, he saw blood. Damn it! he exclaimed, as he placed the blade on the countertop before turning in the direction his wife had gone. Honey, I got another boo-boo. I need a band-aid, Kevin said, walking in her direction as he spotted her entering the living room. Inspecting his new wound, he quickly became concerned as to its depth, due to the amount of blood streaming down his thumb. Wait, what? What is happening? Kevin drunkenly asked. Everything in the room began to darken as if he were walking backwards into a cave. Even Mary seemed to be getting farther away as she ran toward him with a very concerned look. Then suddenly, Mary was gone, and only darkness remained. What is happening? Kevin thought, looking around. Kevin reached out for anything, though he was not sure if he really was reaching out into the dark, or only thinking he was. He placed his hands upon his body and could feel his own body. Where the hell am I? Unexpectedly, the area brightened. 
In front of Kevin stood his own shadow, surrounded by light. Slowly, he turned to investigate the source of the light. As he turned, the darkness vanished, and before him were three men. Two of the men swung large sledgehammers, as another sat on the floor with a smaller handheld hammer. They all struck at a glowing mass that exploded in sparks each time they hit it. Kevin watched the man with the smaller hammer strike a spot on the glowing mass, followed by the other two men striking the same spot with theirs. I know what is happening here. This is the old Japanese swordsmithing technique. Where the hell am I? I must be dreaming, Kevin thought. Looking down at his injured thumb, Kevin noticed that the cut was still there, but blood no longer flowed from it. Though he was puzzled by the sight, it couldn't compare to everything around him. Spinning around to look behind him, he saw a wooden wall. I have to be dreaming, he said, reaching out to the wall only to have his hand pass through it. Yeah, definitely a dream. Wait, did I go to bed? His mind raced with questions. Turning his attention back to the men, Kevin shrugged and asked aloud, Am I dreaming? Nothing, not even the slightest reaction from the three, just one blow after another upon the molting pile of metal. Hey, I asked a question here. Am I dreaming? Kevin asked again, only this time more frustrated. Again, nothing. Walking over, Kevin reached out to grab the nearest man's shoulder. Again his hand passed through. Looking at his hand as though maybe it wasn't really there, Kevin said, Yeah, definitely a dream. At that moment, a little boy came through the door. Why a little boy? There wasn't a little boy in the documentary I saw last month, Kevin thought, now believing all this was a dream about what he had watched on TV. Yet everything seemed so real, even to the heat emanating from the metal and the forge. Father, father, there is a man here asking for you, the little boy said, loud enough to be heard over the striking of hammers. Noticing the slight nod of his father's head, the little boy turned and exited the door from which he had entered. Many minutes passed with the men hammering the hot ball of metal until it had grown too cool and needed to be placed back into the forge. Once the man finished covering the steel in glowing hot coal, he stood. Watch closely, he instructed one of the other men before going outside. Kevin followed the swordsmith curiously. Just outside, two men stood waiting with their horses' reins in hand. Once they spotted the swordsmith, the closest man began speaking. We are here by command of our daimyo. He requests you construct him a sword of the highest quality, for which you will be paid greatly. Observing the symbols and colors these two men wore, the swordsmith recognized they were not from his province. I can only construct weapons for those under the rule of Daimyo Nobunaga. I am honored by your Daimyo's request, but cannot provide fulfillment. Good journey, the swordsmith replied as he turned to go back to work. Our Daimyo does not accept no. He gets what he wants and pays well for services. The man stood holding his horse's reins in one hand while shaking a bag with gold coins in the other. Stopping to speak, but not turning back to face the man, the swordsmith responded, I cannot provide fulfillment of this request. Without another word, he walked back into the building. He gets what he wants. We will be back, the man shouted angrily while he and his companion mounted their horses. Watching the two men ride away, Kevin thought, well, this is better than the documentary. Hearing the hammers hitting once again with impressive power, Kevin hurried inside to watch. He marveled at the discipline each man displayed as they worked what started out as many red-hot pieces of steel into one single mass. Kevin watched for what he felt were days as the men hammered, cut, folded, heated, and hammered until they had a long piece of steel. There were even times he had walked with the man and his son to a nearby stream where they caught fish to have with rice later that night. This is the most realistic and long dream I have ever had, Kevin thought, 
watching the swordsmith begin his morning ritual of starting the fire for the forge with one of his apprentices. Slowly, the swordsmith struck the tip of a long, slender piece of steel, smashing it between his hammer and anvil. From iron comes fire, he said to his apprentice as his strikes grew faster. After a few minutes, the swordsmith shoved the iron rod into a nest of very dry wood shavings he had prepared earlier. Within seconds, smoke began rising from within. Just like every other morning, flames appeared after two puffs of air from the swordsmith. After their fire had reached the proper temperature, the steel was placed inside once again. Kevin watched for what seemed like several more days as the bladesmith hammered the steel into a long, straight blade shape, hammered bevels in along one edge, and used files to shape the steel to his specifications. To Kevin's amazement, the swordsmith took a handheld planning tool containing only a small, narrow metal rod in the middle worked it down the length of the blade, and created a groove running from one end to the other on both sides. Kevin, what happened to you? Wake up! Please come back to me! Mary? Kevin said as loud as he could, looking around but spotting nobody. Within that moment, the sword being made had gone from being shaped to covered in clay and submerged in water with steam bubbling up. How did I miss so much? Kevin thought, focusing hard on the swordsmith to not miss anything else. Each day that passed fascinated Kevin as he watched the smith work the sword back and forth on stones, shaping and polishing the steel until finally it was down to little flakes of stone that the smith placed between his fingers and the steel, occasionally sprinkling them with water. Once that had finished, leaving a near mirror finish on the sword, Kevin watched as the smith chiseled his signature into the tang. Moments later, the smith's wife walked in with a beautiful white silk-wrapped handle and guard. With great care, the handle and guard were placed onto the sword and finished with a small bamboo pin running through the handle. Kevin couldn't believe the beauty of the sword he watched form before his eyes. I need dreams like this every night. With that thought, the smith's son came running in from outside. Father! Father! They're back! Calmly, the smith slid the sword into its wooden sheath and placed it on a nearby rack before standing. Looking to his son, the smith said, Go to your mother. Then he stepped outside. The instant the smith spotted the two on horseback, the same rider as before began to speak. Do you have our daimyo sword, as requested? Faced with the two armed men, the swordsmith replied, As I stated, this request cannot be filled. It is forbidden by Daimyo Nobunaga, ruler of this province. Good journey. The swordsmith knew that wouldn't be the end. As he calmly walked inside, he heard the two grumbling men as they dismounted their horses. Kevin could feel his heart racing as he followed the smith inside, to where the newly completed sword sat. They're coming in, Kevin shouted, but still nobody could hear him. Seeing the first man enter the doorway, Kevin ran fast as he could, hoping to drive the man off his feet and back out the door. He had forgotten the only thing he seemed to be able to interact with is the ground as he passed through him, tumbling onto the ground outside. Shit, he screamed, standing up and rushing inside, only to find that time had once again skipped. Inside was dripping red. Blood had been splashed all around and ran from bodies on the floor. The two riders were dead, with one absent his head. On the far end of the room lay the swordsmith, holding his dead wife and the sword, blood flowing steadily from his chest. Son, come here, son, the bladesmith called out. Little blood bubbles passed through his lips with each word spoken. Kevin watched helplessly as the little boy entered the room from where he had been hiding, his face stricken with horror and tears. Reaching out with the blood-soaked sword, the smith ordered his son, Take it to Tomo. As his son took the blade, the swordsmith fell lifeless upon his wife, 
With a stream of tears, the little boy ran from the room and down the path outside. Kevin watched on as the room became dark. Soon, he was once more engulfed in darkness. This time he felt something. In his hand was another squeezing his. What's going on? He thought. Kevin, Kevin, can you hear me? He heard Mary's sobbing voice. Mary? He asked as he struggled to open his eyes. Yes, yes, wake up. Wake up now, he heard her say. With unfocused vision, Kevin looked around, unsure what was happening. After a few blinks cleared his sight, he became even more puzzled. Where am I? He asked. He felt the weight of Mary pressing against him, squeezing him tight, then heard her calling out for a doctor. Is this another dream? He thought. You scared me! Don't ever do that again! Mary chastised him while attempting to dry her tears before the doctor came in. Now becoming more aware of where he was, Kevin asked, Why am I in a hospital? How long have I been here? Before Mary could reply, a doctor entered the room and began his examinations. After a few minutes, he placed an order for a 1,000 milliliters bolus of lactate ringers with the nurse that had been assigned to Kevin. After that was completed, the doctor directed his attention to Kevin and Mary. It appears everything is good. Mary, I don't need to explain to you what happens now. Rest assured we will have you two out of here soon as the results come back clear. With that, he smiled and left the room. Still puzzled by what was happening, Kevin asked, What the hell happened? Mary explained how he was already swaying when she came into the living room and had fallen to the floor before she could reach him. After he wouldn't respond to her, she called for an ambulance. After he was seen by countless doctors, they couldn't find any reason why he was not responding. Well, let's get out of here. I have an appointment with a client tomorrow, Kevin said. He tried to rise, only to feel extreme stiffness in his muscles. Tears ran from Mary's eyes as she spoke. That was two weeks ago, 